Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. Today we're talking about the price of food and its impact on the poor. In the studio with us today we have Isabel Fry. She's the Director of the Studies in Poverty and Inequality Institute. Welcome to SACSIS, Isabel. Thank you very much and thank you for this opportunity. You're welcome. Now, food's been very much in the headlines recently. Um, we've heard about the horse meat scandal in the UK and in South Africa as well. We've had uh, recent cases being reported of donkey meat being found in certain processed foods. Unfortunately, it's always the poor that are hardest hit when we hear about these cases. Um, it tends to be that these products are aimed at the lower end of the market. And on Saxis this week, we're actually publishing an article that's going to look at how food is being produced. And we're going to link to that from this video. But our discussion this morning, as I said earlier, is going to be focusing on the price of food and its impact on the poor. And we're going to be talking to Isabel about this because her institute has actually done some research um, on food pricing. Now, Isabel, tell us, um, why did this research, uh, what was the thinking behind it, what food products did you focus on, uh, and what have you found? Thank you. Um, well, a number of, of reasons came together for us when um, we were doing some preliminary reading into uh, the income and expenditure of our poor people. I mean, firstly, uh, in South Africa, Section 27 of the Constitution guarantees a right to food. Um, and we're one of the few countries that has this as a justiciable right. And yet at the same time, we're seeing that a lot of people still go to bed hungry. The interesting thing, as you talked about the kind of production of food, is that in South Africa, our constitution has both a vertical and a horizontal application. So it doesn't just bind the state, it also binds uh, the private sector. Um, and the interesting thing is once you look at the Competition Commission's findings on a number of the price collusions around the production of bread, for instance, with the Tiger brands. Um, to what extent is the private sector actually being held accountable for their production of food? So on the one hand, it was for us about trying to really unpack the impact of, of, of a right that is not being uh, realized and not being enjoyed by people and how we do that. Um, at the same time, we've been looking, tracking the inflation um, impact for poor people because the way that the CPI basket of inflation is, is packaged in South Africa um, really reflects the purchasing, the, the, the sort of interests of those who have the greatest purchasing power. So it's the middle class and then sort of the elites whose purchasing trends determine what goes into that basket. And so if you actually look at the inflationary impact on poor people who spend the bulk of their income relative on food and on transport, um, that's where we've seen the greatest increases in energy of late. Um, and so in a way the, the purchasing power of poor people is being eroded. So we wanted to know what that impact had um, on people's right to food and, um, and also what the, the kind of invisible difference was between, for instance, middle class suburbia um, and people living in townships. Uh, and so what we did was we've been tracking over the last 18 months uh, differentials in food prices, both between suburban um, suburban supermarkets where people could actually benefit from bulk buying and then uh, township-based um, supermarkets and then also spaza shops. Tell us, um, did you find in your, re or did you look in your research to see what percentage of people's income is being spent on food? Yeah, our income and expenditure survey that we did at a micro level over the last 12 months um, in Everton, we uh, worked with 142 households and over a year captured their food diaries um, and also just their general income. Uh, and it correlated quite closely with the national statistics and that showed that up to up to 26% um, of income was being spent on food, which for any single item um, or any single sort of purchasing trend is quite significant. Um, especially when you look at the value that um, social grants, for instance, have, uh, where social grants for many people form the, the, the primary source of regular income. Um, and in the last budget um, two weeks ago, what we saw with that social grants, so they got a nominal increase. Their purchasing power, would, in fact, in real terms, didn't increase beyond inflation. So actually everybody who'd been in receipt of a grant this year is going to find that their grant goes left, it doesn't go as far as it did, let alone go further. 
uh, our constitution guarantees that people have, uh, that the state has a right to progressively realize socioeconomic rights. And yet when you see an erosion in the real purchasing power, that's a regressive step, not a progressive step. Can you tell me if you looked at the basket of goods in terms of its nutritional value? Um, what is the impact of this food price on the nutrition of poor people? Um, one of the, the main coping mechanisms that we discovered uh, when people have a shock and have a um, greater uh, command over less money is in fact that they, per they opt to purchase food with less nutritional value. Um, and so what we did was we tracked a number of Mealy Meal brands um, because from the outside they all look the same and there's a price differential. But when you actually look at the nutritional value of them, uh, the, most, the cheapest brands basically just contain the husks. Um, without any real substantial nutritional value. So that's one of the main areas um, in terms of food is that although people might be buying something which makes them feel full, uh, the nutritional value is, is slight. And so people might be eating but you still have high levels of malnutrition which then impacts directly onto later um, lifestyle uh, diseases such as diabetes and also developmental um, abilities of children at that young age. Um, we found that very little meat was being consumed in the poorer households. Um, but the interesting thing that we also found was that the, the supermarkets in township areas are often linked to main uh, super, sort of suburban supermarket chains like Pick and Pay and Boxer for instance and ShopRite as opposed to ShopRite you save. Um, but the goods that were being sold at the, in the um, township supermarkets um, had a far shorter short sh uh, shelf life um, and basically were not the kind of things that would ever be purchased in suburban supermarkets. The packaging was poor, um, the kind of origins were obscure, the labelling was, was virtually non-existent. And so the ability of poor people to actually have that command over what they consume is much less. Uh, you also then have a knock-on effect because in the absence of a, a fridge or refrigerator, people then have to purchase on a daily basis. Um, and that increases the price and it increases um, the time consumed in, in kind of collecting the food. I mean, the interesting thing for us that we found that the spaza shops um, was that at that level, there's also a, a price collusion. And so you find the same, you find spaza shops in the same road selling a head of cabbage for exactly the same price. So although on the one hand, it's a, I mean, there's a completely different level of sort of economic bartering going on, it still means that competition for poor people is limited uh, because they can't choose to purchase from the shop next door uh, because they all have the, the same prices. But the reality for people is that the choice is limited. What we found um, in Everton where we were working was that there is um, a surprisingly low level of food garden activity. So people don't produce for themselves. Um, and Any reason behind that? Um, a lot of people see food production as being a community activity, so the schools would do it. Um, but there, there hasn't been a tradition of, of producing for own consumption in peri-urban areas uh, that we've found. Uh, so in a way there's also, the, for the younger, we met this amazing young cooperative of people called Young Agricultural Ambassadors. Um, and they were all matriculants who had sort of unemployed and they decided to form a co-op. And started about growing cabbage and uh, farming pigs. Um, but for them they said that they first had to overcome quite a, a strong prejudice that uh, agricultural work was for peasants, uh, kind of rurally based peasants, and that they were young, they were hip, they didn't have to do that. Um, and it was actually through working and seeing the impact that it made on the local school that these kids got together and are now have an amazing partnership and um, they sell to the fresh produce uh, market. Um, but again, the, the, the choices that people have are determined by the market. So, I mean, we would investigate in the extent to which people produce or bake for themselves. Um, and yet you have such a high level of um, sort of LinkedIn businesses at, a, at the sort of higher level end of the market that you've got the same people who can access the grain, who can produce the bread, who then have distribution circles such that it's cheaper 
for people to buy a loaf of bread that gets produced elsewhere than it is for them to form a collective and, and produce their own and so increase their own um, control over economic ability. So if one of the things that we really need to look at is just the extent of the control of food production in a country where people should have far greater choices um, and you should see far greater uh, command over what the private sector is doing. I was going to ask you about that. Did you look in any way at how they are able to manipulate and control the price of food? Um, that hasn't been part of our survey to date. I mean, we've heard a lot of anecdotal evidence that there's a lot of price matching, for instance, between frozen chicken and pilchards, uh, both uh, being representative of the sort of level of um, a protein that poor people are able to purchase. When one goes up, however, the other goes up as well. Um, so those are further things that need a lot of investigation. And the question is, I mean, who's really interested in doing this? Um, because the, the kind of the, the glamour doesn't exist when you're scraping around for food. Um, and for me this year, one of the challenges is, how do you make a right to food? Uh, something which somebody can actually, if you want to be commercial, take to the bank, you know. Um, how does a right translate into a full stomach? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I, to, just to take that a little bit further, what role do you see for government and what, do you, what role do you see for the private sector in realising that right? Um, I think the government needs to be more proactive in responding to uh, challenges that, such as those that are put before the Competition Commission. Um, I think if you remember uh, the last price fixing um, matter that was heard, the, the firms were fined um, and then the, the, I think the fine went to the Economic Development Department. Um, the question is how do you make the state needs to put in place regulation that makes it hurt for people who are making the poor hurt. Um, and a small fine is something which you can just sort of shrug off and, and write down for the following year. Um, so that's the question to my mind, is, is firstly the kind of regulation and investigation powers and whether the Competition Commission has sufficient powers, whether they need to be deregulated, uh, sorry, uh, decentralized um, and have far greater reach across the country. Um, but then also whether the penalties are sufficient. Uh, question around the private sector um, is something I think firstly people need to go back to the point that uh, not every activity can be a, a massive profit driven activity. I mean if you're producing food, why are you producing food? Is there, is there not a level of solidarity that exists? And so it's reviewing that. Now that might be very um, idealistic but if there in the absence of any show of good faith, um, then I would trust that the state comes in harder. Um, but I think the, the other point that, I, I that we touched on is um, how we encourage people to produce for themselves, and so to have that command and that control. Um, and then again, linking the level of uh, nutritional threshold to something like social grants. Um, historically, the value of social grants have been completely arbitrarily set. Uh, there's no link between need um, and supply. Uh, and so if one takes the, the child support grant, which has now been increased to 300 rand a month, what does that purchase, um, especially in households where it's the sole source of income? Uh, to what extent are people able to survive? And then the question that we're grappling with is, um, if you take wage income and you take your social wage, as well, the state provides, and you still have a deficit, whose responsibility is that? Um, is the responsibility of the poor to always look after the poor? Um, or can we not see ourselves as being more dynamic, um, moving towards a social democracy where the state underwrites and that's, provide, that's um, paid for by those who have the ability to do so? Isabel Fry, thank you very much for joining us and thank you for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service.